let's discuss problem number 5 on time complexity of loops the topic is time complexity of loops solved problem let's proceed and let's see the problem first here is the problem consider the following function we have this function the name of this function is unknown the return value of the function is theta of n square theta of n square log n theta of n cube or theta of n cube log n. We need to determine the return value of this function unknown. The return value of this function is k. So, we need to find the value of k. And we are not interested in finding the exact value of k. We are interested in finding the asymptotic value of k and that too represented in theta notation. So, now let's find the value of k. For this, Let's create some space over here for the solution. So, let's remove this part of the question. And now, let's focus on this code and let's try to understand how this code works. We have this function unknown. The return type of this function is int. This means this function will return an integer value. And the parameter is n. So, n will receive some value which is the input to this function. Within this function, this statement is written which declares three variables i, j and k where k is initialized to 0. Then we have this nested for loop structure. I am saying this is nested for loop structure because this for loop is within this for loop and we can observe in the outer for loop variable i is initialized to n by 2 i is compared with n and i is incremented by 1. Within this for loop, we have another for loop. And in this for loop, variable j is initialized to 2. j is compared with n and j is updated to j times 2. And within this for loop, we have this statement k equal to k plus n by 2. We are interested in finding the asymptotic value of k because this will be returned by this function. And according to the question, we need to find the return value of this function, which is k. Also, we can observe that this structure is independent nested loop structure. The reason is that the inner for loop is independent of the outer for loop because in the inner for loop, we are not using the outer loop variable i. In any of these statements, we are not using this variable i. The first statement is j equal to 2. The second statement is j less than or equal to n. The third statement is j equal to j times 2. In any of these statements, we are not using this variable i. Therefore, this for loop is independent of this for loop. So, this structure is independent nested loop structure. Now, let's focus on this statement. Because we need to find the value of k, so we need to be concerned about the statement. In this statement, we are updating k by k plus n by 2. We are adding n by 2 to k in each iteration of these two for loops. In the first iteration, we will get k as n by 2. Because the initial value of k is 0, so this will be replaced by 0. 0 plus n by 2 is n by 2. So, the new value of k will be n by 2. So, in the first iteration, we will get n by 2 as the value of k. What happens in the second iteration? In the second iteration, n by 2 is added to n by 2. This gives us 2 times n by 2. So, the new value of k will be 2 times n by 2 in the second iteration. Similarly, in the third iteration, we will get k as 3 times n by 2. In the fourth iteration, we will get 4 times n by 2. In the fifth iteration, we will get 5 times n by 2. And this will continue, let's say, up to t times n by 2. So, let's assume t is the last iteration number. And t times n by 2 is therefore the final value of k. Because after t, there is no iteration for which these loops will run. After t, these two for loops will terminate and k will be returned from this function. 
So the final value of k will be t times n by 2. We need to find the value of t. This will give us the final value of k. And what is t? t represents the number of times n by 2 is added to k. Because k is equal to t times n by 2, so t represents the number of times n by 2 is added to k. We need to know how many times n by 2 is added to k. So it is clear that we need to know the number of times n by 2 is added to k to calculate the final value of k. If you are assuming that t represents the number of times n by 2 is added to k, then the final value of k will be t times n by 2. Not only this, t also represents the last iteration number. And it is same as the number of times these two for loops will execute, which is same as the number of times this statement will execute. So, it makes sense that the number of times n by 2 added to k is same as the number of times k equal to k plus n by 2, which is this statement, is executed. So, if we know the number of times this statement will execute, we will get to know the number of times n by 2 is added to k, and this means we will find the final value of k. The number of times k equal to k plus n by 2 is executed is same as the frequency count of k equal to k plus n by 2. So, we just need to find the frequency count of this statement. How do we find the frequency count of this statement? By analyzing these two for loops. We know that this structure is independent nested loop structure. And in order to find the frequency count of this nested loop structure, we need to find the frequency count of the outer loop structure, then the inner loop structure, and then we need to multiply the frequency counts. This will give us the total frequency count of this nested loop structure, which is same as the frequency count of this statement k equal to k plus n by 2. So, first we will find the frequency count of the outer for loop. Then we will find the frequency count of the inner for loop. Then we will multiply them to find the total frequency count, which is the frequency count of this statement. And from this frequency count, we can deduce the value of k. So, now let's analyze the first for loop, which is for i equal to n by 2, i less than or equal to n i plus plus. In the first iteration, the value of i is n by 2 because i is initialized to n by 2. In the second iteration, it will be n by 2 plus 1. This is the new value of i in the second iteration because i is incremented by 1. So, we will get n by 2 plus 1. In the third iteration, we will get n by 2 plus 2 because i is again incremented by 1. In the same way, we can continue up to, let's say, n by 2 plus t, and I'm assuming n by 2 plus t is the last value of i for which this condition is true. Now, we can observe that this for loop will execute t plus 1 times, because in the first iteration, the value of i is n by 2 plus 0. So, 0 is here in the first iteration. In the second iteration, we have 1 here. In the third iteration, we have 2 here. It is clear that after the plus sign, the value depends on the iteration number. It is 1 less than the iteration number. Here we have t, so the iteration number must be t plus 1. So the last iteration is t plus 1 of this for loop. Therefore, this for loop will execute t plus 1 times. And as we have assumed that n by 2 plus t is the last value of i for which this condition is true. So, we can assume that n by 2 plus t is equal to n. Now, we can find t in terms of n. This is not useful. We need to represent t in terms of n because n represents the input. And according to this input, we need to represent the frequency count of this for loop. 
n by 2 plus t is equal to n. Let's try to solve this equation to find the value of t in terms of n. We can take the LCM here. We will get n plus 2t by 2 in the LHS. In the RHS, we have n. Now, we can multiply both sides by 2. So, in this way, we can remove this denominator. So, we will get n plus 2t equal to 2n. After solving this equation, we will get t equal to n by 2. You can solve the equation on your own and you will observe that t is equal to n by 2. We can now replace this t by n by 2. So, we will get n by 2 plus 1 times here. This means this for loop, that is this outer for loop, will execute n by 2 plus 1 times. So, now we know the frequency count of this outer for loop, which is n by 2 plus 1. Now we need to determine the frequency count of this inner for loop. For this, let's analyze this for loop. Now we need to analyze the inner for loop, which is for j equal to 2, j less than or equal to n, j equal to j times 2. In the first iteration, the value of j is 2. In the second iteration, it will become 2 times 2, which is equal to 2 square. In the third iteration, the value of j will be 2 cube. In the same way, we can continue up to, let's say, 2 power t. So, this is the last value of j for which this condition is true. So, we can assume 2 power t is equal to n. So, 2 power t is n. Now, we can solve this equation to find the value of t. In order to bring this t to the base, we can take log on both sides. Let's apply log base 2 on both sides because here we have the constant 2. So, let's take log base 2 on both the sides. After applying log on both sides, we are getting log 2 power t base 2 in the LHS and log n base 2 in the RHS. Log 2 power t base 2 is same as t times log 2 base 2 and log 2 base 2 is equal to 1. So, we are getting t here in the LHS. And in the RHS, we have log n base 2. So, t is equal to log n base 2. And from this pattern, we can observe that the last iteration is the tth iteration because in the first iteration, the power of 2 is 1. In the second iteration, the power of 2 is 2. In the third iteration, the power of 2 is 3. So, the power of 2 is dependent on the iteration number. If we are in the third iteration, the power of 2 will be 3. If we are in the second iteration, the power of 2 will be 2. So, it is clear that in the tth iteration, the power of 2 will be t. So, this is the value of j in the tth iteration and hence, there are a total of t iterations of this for loop. Hence, this for loop will execute t times. Now, we can replace t by log n base 2. This is what we obtained. So, let's replace this by log n base 2. So, this for loop will execute log n base 2 times. Now, to summarize, the first for loop executes n by 2 plus 1 times. This is the outer for loop. And the second for loop, which is the inner for loop, executes log n base 2 times. We know this structure is independent nested loop structure. Therefore, we can multiply these two frequency counts to obtain the total frequency count of this structure. So, the total frequency count is same as n by 2 plus 1 times log n base 2. Now, we need to multiply these two terms to obtain the total frequency count. After expansion, we will get n by 2 times log n base 2 plus 1 times log n base 2. Now, we can eliminate the constant from the denominator and the bases of the logarithms. We will get n log n plus log n. And out of these two terms, n log n is the dominating term. Therefore, the time complexity will be theta of n log n. So, clearly the frequency count of these two for loops is n log n. And the time complexity is therefore theta of n log n. Therefore, k equal to k plus n by 2, that is this statement, will execute n log n times. Why n log n times? Because 
the frequency count of this statement is same as the frequency count of these two for loops. We got the frequency count of these two for loops as n log n. Therefore, k equal to k plus n by 2 will execute n log n times. So, with this we know the frequency count of this statement. And recall that the frequency count of this statement is same as the number of times n by 2 is added to k. Let's now determine the value of k for each iteration. k is n by 2 in the first iteration because k is initialized to 0. In the first iteration, the value of k is n by 2. In the second iteration, it will be 2 times n by 2. In the third iteration, it will be 3 times n by 2. This will continue up to, let's say, t times n by 2. And we know the frequency count of this statement is same as the number of times n by 2 is added to k. And t represents the number of times n by 2 is added to k. So, t is equal to n log n. And therefore, the final value of k, which is t times n by 2, will be n log n times n by 2, which is equal to theta of n square log n. I have eliminated this constant and I have multiplied n by n log n. We will get n square log n. Therefore, theta of n square log n is the final value of k. And this is the asymptotic value of k in terms of theta notation. This means after completion of this for loop, we will get this asymptotic value of k. And this means the return value of this function is theta of n square log n. So, the correct option is option b, theta of n square log n. So, with this we are done with this topic and hence we are done with this lecture. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation. I will see you in the next one.